I'd like to start off with a continuation of quantification. So the next section, 1.5, uh, nested quantifiers is obviously going to be coming up, and I'll do that in the next video. For now, I just want to kind of go back and continue on quantifications and go back to the one that I left with in terms of turning each of these four sentences uh, into English and spoken English and trying to go through this idea of when are they true and when are they false and which ones are most commonly used. Now, in terms of common use, we tend to use these two versions are the most common words of an all or a sum. So the first one, uh, as covered in the last lecture, was this idea of that for all possible birds, if it is a raven, then it is black, would be along the lines of simply saying that all ravens are black. And when we would have this, this would be true if for every raven that we found it was black. This would also be true vacuously if there were no ravens, right? So I could have a non-existent bird and say, uh, for all, all, for all filibird, then it's black. If it doesn't exist, it's vacuously true. That idea of all are this, of uh, these two components being vacuously true, allows us to you know, literally say certain things. For example, I can say all of my grandchildren are married. Well, I have no grandchildren, so it's vacuously true. I can say whatever I want if the hypothesis of this first component has not been met. The second version of the universal statement, which would be for all birds, there's no if in here because this is and, for all birds, they are a raven and they are black. So this would tell us for this one, just simply everything in the universe of discourse, which happens to be all birds, are just simply black ravens, which is very different from all ravens are black. This one, if so if I have conjunction under an all, really what you're doing is saying everyone within this domain has these two properties. So you might use this um, if students come into a room and they all sit down and they're taking my class, I could say everyone in this room is taking math 321 and is sitting down right now. So that'd be giving two properties that's universally true for an entire group. On the other hand, we typically, when we have two predicates, they're normally under this idea of all of one are type two, all ravens are black. So if it's a raven, it's necessary for it to be black. Then in terms of uh, doing these problems, this, this is typically what we say when we have two predicates and we use the word all. On the other hand, if you want to talk about you know, this conjunctive version of everybody in a room has all these properties. You could use it as conjunctive, but it's just not as common. On the other hand, this sum version, so there is some bird such that it is a raven and it is black. And so this would be an example of I found something in my entire domain that has two things. So it's, you know, you can compare these two right here. This says everybody has these two properties. The bottom one says, well, there's some special guy in here who has these two properties. And so someone in my class is taking math 321 and standing, right? It's like maybe everybody's sitting except for one. Maybe everybody's sitting except for two. So it's enough for me to say that someone has two properties. It's kind of what we normally say, right? Uh, some guy named Mark teaches math. Well, okay, you're just finding two properties. You could even do, you know, three properties if you want. Some guy named Mark teaches math and his office is 314 Jabara Hall. Uh, you would just have a bunch of ats and you're explaining that this special few, either one or more, have and you just conjunctively list out all the properties. And so that's a common thing that we do. I want to compare it to this one here though in terms of the implication. So if I would look at this and say, okay, this says the, this part says that there's some black raven. Well, what does this say? It says for all the birds, if it is a raven, sorry, not for all, there's some bird out there that if it happened to be a raven, then it was black. Well, you know, that would be true, you know, if you had a black raven, just like if this was true, if I had a black raven, this would be true. If I had a black raven, left side would be true. So how are they different from each other? Well, these are different in one specific way. 
they're different in the fact that this could be vacuously true, right? There's out of all the birds, for some birds, right? There is some birds such that if it's a raven, well, what if there are no ravens, right? <laughs> there is some bird that if it was a raven, then it was black, could be tr would be true if there were no such things as ravens. So um, it'd be like this. Uh, there is some child such that if they were my grandchild, then they would be married. Well, that would kind of like make you feel that, well, Mark has a married grandchild. Well, if I had a grandchild, it'd be necessary for it to be married. But on the other hand, I have no grandchildren. So this is vacuously true. And so this one has the possibility, this first one would be true in the case that there are no ravens. But on the other hand, the second one would not be true if there were no ravens. Because if there were no ravens, this would be false. So um, they don't, if the second is true, the first is obviously true, right? But it doesn't necessarily go back the other way because of the vacuousness. And so this one on the left allows for non-existence of ravens. The other one does not. And most people would say, I really believe that if you're talking about black ravens, that there are such a thing as ravens. So we would normally do this. The left is, if you're talking about black ravens, and there might not be such a thing as ravens, you would use the left, but it's not very common. Now, all that stuff I just did, this verbal explanations of, of what I've talked about, is this idea of taking the symbols that you see and putting them into English and asking for things like, when is this true? When is this not true? And talking about it in a rigorous way. And, you know, one of the kind of like on this example, it'd be fun. Just go ahead and watch this YouTube video. You can go find it. Just search it. It's called The Raven Paradox. And there's a group that does little philo uh, philosophy videos called Wireless Philosophy. And one of the things they talked about is this idea that uh, for all birds, if it is a raven, then it is black. Well, this is logically consistent, logically the same as it's not the case that there exists a raven and it is not black. All right, those are logically the same thing. That is using the the disjunctive version of implication and then a negation is passed through and get it out here and so this part here would be just simply that'd be the existence of a counterexample. So what I'm saying is all ravens are black is there is not a counterexample. Um, so that's what kind of that gets to. There exists something that's a raven that's not black which would be a counterexample to this all. On their discussion one of the things that they talk about is they notice that well hey um, what happens if you see a blue chair? Well, obviously a blue chair, you know, this is saying there it's you haven't found a non-black raven. <laughs> so really when you look at a blue chair, you would say or a red chair, it's like that's not a counter example. And one of the, th the idea of their paradox is this idea of well, if this is true, then this is true. Well, yes. Right? Normally when we do normal implication, you would have uh, P implies Q is logically the same as it is not the case that P and not Q, right? So if you would have that, by the way, this is true, then this is true, right? So I, I have not found a counterexample, therefore this is true. And so their statement would be, hey, look, this is not a counterexample. That automatically improves proves the implication itself since they're logically the same. The problem is that a for all, <laughs> a for all requires all, right? That means for every bird I've checked that if it is a raven, then it better be black. And if it's not the case, that means this for all still requires you to say, okay, when is this entire thing going to be true? that you have never found a counterexample, which requires you still to go through the entire universe of discourse. Finding one thing that is not a counterexample simply says, well, 
I haven't disproved the first. And it's kind of an interesting idea of real world application, right? You, you're trying to prove something and normally what you do is you do experiments that don't disprove it. <laughs> so you, you have this, it's like, oh, it's not that it's a paradox and I'm somehow proving that all ravens are black by looking at blue chairs or red chairs or people that are wearing green shirts. Every one of those is a non-counter example. Well, I would have to go to look at every object in the known universe and show that every one of them is not a counter example to prove the for all. But in real world, real world application of science, of discussion, of things of this nature, every time you don't find a counter example, it leads you to look at this and say, I can't, I haven't proved that all ravens are black. I haven't looked at every raven on the face of the planet. I haven't looked at every object. I have not observed everything I need to observe. But the more I look, you know, the more, remember, logic in this is just a model, right, of reality. We, we, we already have these things of like knowing that these things are true. And so it's kind of a neat one where we can look at this and do strong logic and write it out and say, literally, what should I do? I need to find every raven on the face of the planet and verify that it's black. That's the only way I could possibly show this to be true always. But then the practical is, well, I, how do we do such things? Well, we normally do experiments and we say, I haven't disproved it, but I haven't proved it. Right, I haven't found a counterexample. And so the idea of this paradox is, you know, you is have you proved it? The answer is no, because I haven't done everything. But on the other hand, I haven't disproved it. And we continue with our research, right? We keep looking for all things and show that the, if it's a raven, then it's black. Or all things have proven to not be a counterexample. And that's kind of the fun thing about application, right? We're going through problems like this and we play games. Right? We're playing with simple discussions until we refine or understand more on how our language and how we interact. And it's nice to play with things until we get a better grasp on how we're actually modeling. So that's one thing I want everybody to be able to do, isn't necessarily to talk about paradoxes or anything else, is to formally understand what's the universe of discourse, when are things true, when are things false, if I have a bunch of symbols, could I put it into a sentence and know when they're true and when they're false as well, as well as go backwards.